What up YouTube, it's Zach here, and today I'm going to be talking to you about something I like to call the anion gap. I like to call it that because that's what it's called. This is a topic that's always confused me, so let's see if we can't get to the bottom of it. The anion gap is a measurement of the balance between cations, those are positively charged particles, and anions, negatively charged particles. It's an important diagnostic tool when you're looking at a metabolic acidosis. We'll come back to its relevance to clinical practice shortly. But first, let's talk about the equation itself. It's sodium plus potassium minus chloride plus bicarbonate. Essentially, measured cations, sodium and potassium, minus measured anions, bicarb and chloride. This equation gives us the difference between them. Basically, how many more cations are there than anions? Let's try that, shall we? Here's a set of values. What do you make the anion gap? Spoilers, it's 10. The normal range is usually given at 3 to 11 millet equivalents per litre, but may vary depending on your lab and which form of the equation you use, so make sure you check. For example, some people take potassium out of the equation. Correctly reasoning, it accounts for only a very small proportion of the positive charge in the serum. For today though, we're going to keep potassium around mostly so it doesn't feel left out. So why all the faff? What are we actually doing this for? Well, here's where it gets interesting, or as interesting as biochemistry ever gets. Remember, as far as electrical charge is concerned, the serum is neutral, like Switzerland. So the total cations should equal the total anions. The anion gap should be zero. So why isn't it? The answer is because we're only measuring some ions. While sodium and potassium account for the vast majority of positive charge, we're ignoring a number of significant anions, including phosphate, sulfate, the anion component of certain organic acids, and negatively charged plasma proteins like albumin. Essentially, this box, full of unmeasured mystery anions, for want of a better term, is what the anion gap represents. So, if the gap is high, remembering that serum is kept neutral, it means that these unmeasured anions account for a greater proportion of the serum's negative charge than usual. The next question is, why is this useful in acidosis? What's the point in calculating this anion gap? Well, Acidosis can be classified as either high anion gap or normal anion gap, and this can be helpful in correctly identifying the cause of the acidosis. We'll begin with the high anion gap acidosis. To put it simply, this is due to an increase in organic acids in the bloodstream. Take lactic acid for example. Lactic acid in solution gives us H plus protons and a corresponding negatively charged anion. Lactate. Note that this anion is not accounted for in our anion gap calculation. It belongs in our mystery box. In a lactic acidosis, there is an increased presence of H plus protons and lactate in the serum. The excess protons are buffered by bicarbonate to form carbonic acid and then water and CO2 using this equation, which I'll assume for today that you're already familiar with. This buffering process lowers the levels of bicarbonate in the serum. Serum remains electroneutral, there's the same amount of negative charge floating around, but there's more lactate and less bicarb accounting for it. Anion gap increases as an increased proportion of the negative charge is not accounted for by our anion gap calculation. Organic acids causing a high anion gap acidosis include lactic acid, Keto acids such as acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyrate, formic acid, which is a metabolite of methanol, and oxalic acid, which is a metabolite of ethylene glycol. So, causes of a high anion gap acidosis include lactic acidosis, including salicylate toxicity and shock, amongst others, diabetic ketoacidosis, methanol poisoning, and ethylene glycol poisoning. Bottom line, high anion gap acidosis, think more organic acid being produced or ingested. What about a normal anion gap acidosis? This is a little bit more straightforward. Essentially, it's due to bicarbonate loss. 
Bicarb falls and its negative charge is replaced not by those organic acid anions in the mystery box, but by chloride. The kidneys compensate for bicarbonate loss by increasing chloride reabsorption, keeping serum electroneutral. A normal anion gap acidosis can therefore also be referred to as a hyperchloremic acidosis because the levels of chloride will have gone up. Anion gap remains normal. The serum remains electroneutral with the same amount of negative charge accounted for by the anions in our red box here. Just a little less bicarb and a little more chloride. The serum is acidotic as there are fewer bicarbonate ions available to buffer those pesky H plus ions. So what causes bicarbonate loss? The most common cause is diarrhea. The second is renal tubular acidosis. Now there are several different types of RTA, the most common of which is decreased bicarbonate reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule. RTA is a little complex so we won't get into it today. For the time being it's enough to know that it's a thing. Unlike diarrhea, vomiting doesn't tend to cause an acidosis because you're also losing those H plus ions in gastric acid. Now it might seem like a lot to take in, but to put it all simply, when you're looking at a metabolic acidosis, if the anion gap is high, think increased organic acid. If the anion gap is normal, think increased loss of bicarb. Anyway, if you have any other topics that you find difficult or burning questions about medicine that you'd like to ask, please do so and we'll see if we can't put out a few more regular videos in future. In the meantime, stay classy YouTube, we'll see you soon.